Hi everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful week. So um, I'm playing the unicorn. The most requested uh, types of uh, interviews and videos these days are of people in the crypto world. And um, I think one of the most successful videos was on what's going on in crypto. And people were wondering, okay, how does one transition from uh, the normal world, if you want, to uh, the crypto world? And as a result, I thought today we would invite my good friend, Mark Lurie, who went from his own transition from VC to Web2 to crypto with all the ups and downs uh, along with it uh, and a journey that you can learn a lot from. So without any further ado, let's get started. Welcome to episode 33 from VC to Web2 to crypto with Mark Lurie. So Mark, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Fabrice. Really. So uh, be before here. we get into the the meat of the story, maybe give us a little bit of your background and and how you ended up to where you are today. Sure. So I run a company called Shipyard Software. Uh, it is an exchange group for decentralized finance, kind of like Nasdaq uh, or New York Stock Exchange. Uh, I didn't start out here. I started out with an interest in economics. Uh, so in grad, I studied the history of economic thought um, and really just was very interested in the way that economic systems have developed over time. Um, after school at Harvard, I, uh, I joined a venture capital firm called Bessemer Venture Partners, uh, really to get a good sense of how companies actually develop and what's good and what's bad in the uh, you know, throughout the economy. Um, and then I launched a few businesses of my own. One was an online marketplace for art and collectibles. Um, and then I made the shift after I sold that, I made the shift into crypto, uh, with, uh, a registry for NFTs. It was a really early NFT protocol called codex. Um, I led an ICO for that and, uh, fast forward to now, this is now my second venture in crypto and I really love the space and. You know, I think the reason I went into it is because it was a confluence of all my interests, technology, economics, history, and, uh, you know, and, and building things that matter. Um, and so that's what led me to it. And it was a little bit of a winding road, but I think one thing that I uh, learned to appreciate is the importance of operating in areas that you have genuine intellectual interest for. Um, it really makes the journey more pleasurable. And so that's why I ended up here and where I came from. Um, but l l l let's take a step back. So you said right after school, you went to VC. And w what were you trying to learn there? And did you actually learn that? And and did you know you wanted to be a founder after a VC? Or you learned that through the process of being a VC? You know, it's a little more complicated than that. I actually started a business right after college. Uh, I, it was software for the study abroad space. And, uh, I realized very quickly that I didn't know the difference between a company that was good and bad and a market that was good and bad. And I think I had a very rapid, uh, realization of my own naivete. And, and so shortly after I did that, I looked for a job in venture, uh, and I basically emailed every venture capital firm on the East coast and, uh, and one how I got into venture because I realized I needed to actually see thousands of companies to know what good and bad was before I could really go and do it myself again. I and, had to break my own naivete. And why the East Coast? I was on the East Coast. Uh, I had uh, a long-term girlfriend at the time, and uh, I certainly would have moved to the West Coast, but for whatever reason, I uh, I just emailed everyone and wait, so you, on the East Coast. How, how lots, did you do this? So yeah, like of, uh, you emailed, Boston. you cold emailed the found the the partners of the at the firm, you linked in it. I mean, like because many people were like dying to get into VC and hearing that you can maybe get in just by emailing everyone. you know, maybe it's, it wouldn't have struck people as like a path that was viable. You know, it it was an earlier time. So this was 2007, 2008. And, um, and yeah, I just cold emailed everyone. Uh, you know, one thing 
you know, one, uh, it turns out a big part of venture is sourcing deals and the ability to cold email, follow up multiple times and sell in is in some ways a, a good qualifier for a young venture capitalist. And so I think they actually appreciated that. And I don't think a lot of people were doing that or taking the approach at the time. It was one of the earlier kind of analyst programs. Now there's a lot of analyst programs that kind of reach out to companies. And so I think, you know, it was a little bit of right place, right time, but I would say that you create your own luck to a certain extent, right? Like it's just hustle and sales, which is the core. So if you were a young everything. college grad today, dying to get an adventure, you think the same approach would work or what would you do? Or you know that? I would do the same thing. I would go through my LinkedIn. I would ask everyone I could for intros. I would cold email venture capitalists, and then I would email them five, six, 10 times in a row and hope one hits. Uh, it only takes one. And to be fair, I only got one. You know what's funny is actually the way our EIR program started was kind of like that. Someone like kept harassing me and stalking me and like showed up at, at the door of the office. It's like, and I'm like, oh, maybe if I meet him, he'll finally let me, <laughs> let me be and let me be and, and stop harassing me. And instead it led to the creation of an entire entrepreneur and residence program at FJ Labs. So uh, uh, persistence do definitely does pay. <laughs> hustle respects hustle. So you went to to Bessemer Venture Partners. You did you did you get what you were expecting to get? Like uh, seeing thousands of companies and understand what's a bad company versus a good company. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I spoke on the phone with a thousand founders and CEOs over the course of a couple of years, uh, and I think that just gives you pattern recognition and makes you realize the universe of what's possible. Uh, and that context is really important for deciding what to do next. I also think it has some negative impacts um, on being an entrepreneur. But I'm most actually, out of curiosity, since you bring it up, what, what are the negative impacts? You know, I think starting a company is uh, a journey that has to start very early and isn't always rational at the time you do it. And I think venture trains you to look at markets and take this very top-down approach, which is smart and is especially smart for investing. But I think uh, a lot of startups make a forward pass that is kind of one step earlier and requires uh, kind of a, a different level of analysis and intuition than, than just top-down. Um, and so in my first business, um, I was an IR at, you know, at FJ, what was in the future going to become FJ Labs, uh, I took a very top-down approach. And I actually think in retrospect, I would have done it a little differently. Um, and, and so just maybe for the sake of clarification, I think the top-down was like, we analyzed whether the idea, no, the idea made sense, but what we underweighted was probably what the personal connection to the idea is, is what you're trying to say, or you're trying to say something else. So like, what would you do or have done differently in hindsight? I think that in starting a business, and this goes for crypto and other markets, I think it's important to choose an industry that you are excited about staying in, whether your business works out or doesn't, and that's big enough that it has room to maneuver. So if your original hypothesis is incorrect, then you have plenty of room to kind of change the business in little ways that still takes advantage of the connections and the brand and the people you and the team you've built. Um, and so, you know, I would underweight my, I, I would not worry so much about what my hypothesis was for the specific business model. I would just choose a really big market that I like a lot, go with a uh, hypothesis for a business model that I thought was good enough. Uh, and, and that's kind of how I choose what to start instead of really wanting to have high confidence in the specific business model uh, that I, that I go with. So we, of the I, I think we've started a way, way more founder idea fit, uh, since, uh, those days where we're like overvaluing, I think the idea, <laughs> uh, and, and I've taken that absolutely to heart because at the end of the day, you know, it's something you need to be sick with through the good and bad times. And there are going to be many bad times, uh, along the journey on, on the market size thing though, one pushback I've heard from, you know, Peter Thiel. He was like, no, 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 you don't want to take a very large market because the larger the market, 
the more obvious in a way it is and the more competed it is, let's go after a niche. Let's and let's hyper dominate the niche. And yes, it's small. And yes, if you fail, you're probably dead. But if you do hyper dominate, even though it might be small, as you're the dominant player there, you start seeing other opportunities and coin joint spaces uh, uh, around it. Do you, so you, you disagree with uh, Peter's uh, assessment or thesis? Uh, to a certain extent, I, I do disagree, but I think you can reconcile the two views. Um, you know, you can define your space however you want, right? Like when Amazon started out, did it consider its space books or did it consider its space e-commerce? I think in Peter Thiel's approach, he would say, oh, well, they started with books, right? Smaller market. Um, or maybe even they would have started with a certain type of book. Uh, whereas from the founder's perspective, you know, Jeff Bezos was probably thinking, and so that felt like a big market with room to maneuver. And, you know, the, the team and capabilities he built up for books were probably going to be applicable to other categories. Uh, and so I think I can, I can see that. I mean, many to, often in, in um, our to our marketplace founders, we tell them go vertical, right? Go to a city, go to a category, like understand it, dominate it, and then expand from there, whether it's category or geography. That's right. And and the other thing I'd point out is that business risk is just one component of risk uh, as you start a venture. There's also career risk and there's financial risk. Uh, if you raise money, Personal financial risk is a little out of the you know out of the picture. Uh, business risk is what it is, uh, but career risk is also important. And so, starting a business in a market that's big and that you actually want to be in is also beneficial from a career perspective, not just from a business perspective. And I'm not sure Peter Thiel is speaking to that that aspect of uh, personal decision. Yeah, decision no, I think making. he thinks purely of like, are they building huge businesses or not? Yeah, and I guess your point is, you build a company in an industry interesting large area you fail but the skill sets you've acquired are useful enough that a lot of other people will value them and uh you can land on your feet uh, with or without business school uh going back what if you fail then you know choose not to be an entrepreneur on a go forward basis 100 percent. and sometimes you may even end up farther along than if you had climbed the corporate ladder in some ways you can think of entrepreneurship as, as in some ways way less risky uh, and maybe even less risky than climbing the corporate ladder, uh, which is very counterintuitive because entrepreneurship is seen as a very risk loving. Uh, yeah, I've, I've actually often felt uh, that people overestimate how risky it is and also overestimate the downside, the, the, the downside risk or the downside scenario. I mean, what's the worst that happens? Your company goes under, you know, especially if you have many of the backgrounds of the founders who were like whatever McKinsey, Stanford, <laughs> Harvard, you're gonna land on your feet. You know, you'll be extremely valuable. And to your point, perhaps have actually moved further ahead than your colleagues up the corporate ladder by taking this non-traditional path. So I definitely encourage people to not just be in the rat race treadmill and just pursue their passions in entrepreneurship because they'll land in you know, you're you're gonna land on your feet. If you have to sleep in your parents' couches for a few for a year or six months, you know it's not the end of the world either. So, why don't you walk us through a little bit of uh, the, the 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 company in a way we built together, uh, Lofty, out of the VC then EIR program where, where she joined? Maybe I think I've, I've already done a show detailing with that as so we don't necessarily need to spend that much time on that uh, and, and the lessons learned along the way and how it played out and then. And then we can talk about how you transition from that to whatever came next. So uh, Lofty was an online marketplace for uh, valuable art and collectibles. And uh, so that's kind of above eBay, but below Sotheby's and Christie's. And uh, it was unique in that it was an end-to-end -end marketplace. So people would submit items, uh, photos of items. We had a network of appraisers, many from the Antiques Roadshow, who would uh, virtually appraise an item, uh, and then we would sell it online, only picking up, packing, and shipping after it was purchased. And that worked pretty well. Uh, turns out you can appraise pieces virtually. Unit economics were really good. Um, the company was growing pretty well. Ultimately, you know, I think it was a struggle to scale supply. Collectibles is a very supply-driven marketplace. 
And so uh, our marketing channels capped out. And so we ended up selling to a provider of software to auction houses that really brought a lot of the supply. Um, and that enabled, that kind of solved a bottleneck, um, made one plan equal two. And, and so what did you learn along the way? What, uh, what would you have done differently in hindsight? Perhaps pick a different idea, but other than pick a different idea. And, uh, and what happened next for you? I mean, a lot of lessons along the way. Um, one is that sales is really important and isn't something you should run from, uh, online. That's obvious in a B2B context, but it's less obvious in a B2C context online. Um, the second is, uh, you know, a lot of what marketplaces bring, efficiency, uh, transparency, et cetera, are things uh, that we think of as unambiguously good, uh, but it turns out sometimes those are features, not bugs to a market, in particular in the art market. Uh, opacity uh, and it is is often a good thing. So what I learned is stay really close to the customer. These are perhaps obvious. Stay really close to the customer. Uh, be a user, and uh, and be very flexible on your original theses because if you do that, you'll just continually make good decisions that are very close to the customer, and you'll almost always end up in a good place. Um, I think those yeah, were but probably the biggest lessons. I could argue some of the mistakes we made were because we were our own users and we were not the prototypical user, right? Like, so the idea for, you know, people in their thirties, forties or fifties that have a fair amount of money who want to buy or sell art that we would like download an app to a cell phone, take a photo, have the appraiser appraise it, then accept it. And then it's, it's all done for us. And, and it's, you know, made a lot of sense. And we kind of built that and we built, I think a very good UX UI for that turns out that most of the people that have art are in like their 70s and A, were not that tech savvy and B, frankly, liked going to the art gallery and flirting with the gallery attendants and, and didn't need the transparency and optimization of like getting the best price for the item they were looking for. There was an entire like uh, game and play in being part of the art world and going to Art Basel, et cetera. Um, and so being your own user, you know, I think for most ideas, in most cases, if you are representative of the market, is a good idea. The problem is when we are not representative of our own market, that it gets a little bit tricky. Uh, I agree with that. Um, it, it's interesting, though, a lot of the learnings uh, around how the art market works have kind of come NFTs. full circle yeah. now because NFTs are such a big thing in crypto and the market structure is evolving in an extremely similar way. Uh, the parallels are non-obvious, but super So you've sold the company, it found a, a, a home for itself. Uh, what happens next? You know, obviously it wasn't a huge outcome. So when you're a, and, and that took a long time, it was hardly exhausting. Uh, so how does one transition or pivot or whatever we're learning from that? Like, uh, and, and why crypto of all things? So, uh, so I worked at the Acquirer for a little while, and I uh, wanted to go into crypto. Um, it just hit all my interests. And uh, this was in kind of 2017, late 2017. Um, and so I explored kind of a lot of ways to do that, got involved in kind of using it myself. Um, and, you know, really, I think the way to get into crypto is to think about, like, well, what are my strengths? outside of the crypto world, what do I uniquely know? And then where's the overlap with that and, and crypto? Uh, because in many ways, crypto is just another way of doing all the things which we always do in the real economy, right? DeFi is finance. Um, NFTs are art and collectibles. And so for me, I really knew the art market and collectibles market. Um, and so I, uh, and I saw that there was just a real opportunity to use blockchain to benefit that market, um, so would kind of expand it. And so I, I created an early NFT protocol uh, because that was the fusion of my interests. And it was credible um, because it was the fusion of my interests and expertise. And so that's, I guess, the advice that I would give to people trying to go into crypto is think about what makes you valuable and unique. Most companies uh, and also the market 
is going to need that in some way. But it's interesting that, you know, even though Codex, which is like, like the first early NFT protocol, maybe it was just too early, uh, you know, was the confluence of your uh, different interests. Ultimately, you pivoted from that to being in DeFi and building a DEX, and we should talk about what Clipper is and, and how you, you went from one to the other. Because ultimately, it wasn't like using that background and art that <laughs> led you to building whatever, a next generation exchange or financial exchange. Sure, uh, but each thing you do develops your experience, right? The dots all connect in reverse. Um, and so, you know, at the time, my experience and expertise was in art and collectibles, and my interest was in crypto, but I didn't have a lot of expertise, yeah. right? And so, uh, and so I married those two things. Um, this time around, my expertise is in crypto. I've now been in it for five you know, six years, which, which in this world is, is a lifetime. Um, and, uh, and so then I have, you know, I have a different set of expertise and knowledge and awareness and, you know, that, that launches me to do something else, which was not in art, uh, this time. And so I, I think these things build on each other and, you know, you should expect that if you're going into crypto, you're going to probably worth also mentioning, I, if I'm not mistaken, it took you a while, right? And like, find your footing and to get where you are today. And I think many people are worried that, oh, they go in the space, they don't necessarily know that much. And it takes a while to build the knowledge and, and expertise to, to build up. And they need to be comfortable with the fact that it's okay for a year, two years, or even more, you might be treading a little bit of water because eventually you, you'll find like your, your personal market fit. It's really true. And uh, and it's hard because you hear a lot of headlines about how, you know, companies go from and, and entrepreneurs go from zero to 100 miles an hour, you know, by the time they're 21. And the reality, and that's just not the typical reality. I mean, first, most businesses are started by people, successful businesses are started by people, I think, in their 40s. I think there was a study once. And, you know, the the... In any industry, it takes 10 years to really build expertise and know what you're doing. It's really hard to shortcut that. And so whether you're becoming an excellent marketer or a good entrepreneur or really understanding a space or finding where you fit, you know, it's, it's going to take 10 years until you really know what you're doing and expecting it to be faster. I mean, that's great, but it's not always how it goes. And, and that's why, uh, you know, I think you have to give yourself compassion as you take your winding path. There'll be ups and successes, there'll be downs, there'll be failures, but you learn a lot from it all. And, and ultimately, um, if you persist, it all um, comes together. So how did the idea for Shipyard come about and wh what is Shipyard and uh, what are you up to these days? So, uh, so I have an old friend, uh, Abe Othman. We were undergrads together at Harvard um, and we constantly talk crypto and what to do in crypto we started you know we thought about doing a fund at one point he was an advisor to codex um and so we always kick back and ideas back and forth it turns out that abe uh he had done his phd in computer science and he had wrote his dissertation on automated market making um at the time no one really cared about that uh, it was really pre-blockchain fast forward to now and it is the research that underlies a lot of decentralized finance. And so Abe and I started from the, the, the position of like, well, this is something that interests both of us. There's, you know, here are our, our abilities and our interests. And we created a company that really matched them. And that was the genesis for Shipyard Software. Uh, and the vision is to create an exchange group for decentralized finance. So there is a first wave of DEXs in uh, DeFi, like Uniswap, that are kind of one size fits all. There's going to be a second wave of DEXs with more specialized design that have best execution for specific types of users. And we want to build those with a lot of uh, rigor and uh, discipline. And so our first DEX is called Clipper. It has the best prices for trades under $10,000. Uh, we launched it early in the summer and uh 
it has been a top five decks by usage since. Um, we just launched on Polygon a couple of weeks ago. We've done about 70,000 tra trades. Um, and so I think our thesis has really played out, played out um, and, and you know, been successful in this market. Uh, and it's also something that we both just you know what, what, what's interesting is in a way um, your thesis is kind of like the continuation of the verticalization uh, thesis we we've had at FJ Labs and, and marketplaces, uh, which your first company was an example of. But this is a verticalization of Uniswap, but not a verticalization from a from a only you know w which pairs are we trading perspective. It's actually from which customer segment we're going after and how are we best addressing the customer segment? A hundred percent. And so what I'm, it, oh, that's sorry. right. And? and, and, and what's interesting is, you know, DeFi, I just want to emphasize this and crypto in general is so young. There is so much opportunity to improve upon what's there already. Uh, and so any component of the market you go into and you think really deeply about, uh, you can figure out a way to add a lot of value and verticalization of the first generation is like great. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're thinking of verticalizing OpenSea, right? Like OpenSea is like one size fits all across every single category. There has to be a better way to do it for different categories. And and think of it like brain trust in a way. It's like a first example of like a vertical labor marketplace on, on, on crypto, which makes a lot of sense. And we're at the very beginning, it's interesting because like so many people in the space who've been in the space for so many years who like feel that everything's been done. But if you come at it from the outside lens, you know, th there's a statistic that, or maybe there's only like 300K crypto degens, right? Like <laughs> we have barely hit the mass market, even though there are millions of MetaMask wallets out there in terms of like people that are active and doing something. It's a tiny number. Like I, I see what's happening. Whenever I'm like connecting my MetaMask or like doing a trade on Clipper, I, I it kind of in my the back of my mind of like my, a modem dialing in, you know, and going to the early web pages. Like I really feel like we're in '98. Maybe we're even in '95. I mean, maybe we're '99 from a crypto winter coming down the pike sooner rather than later. But like from a development of the space perspective, we're in 1995. Everything remains to be built. It, it is so true, uh, so true. I mean, it is the user experience is still really tough. There's actually only a small number of users when you think about technology, you know, markets in general, and uh, and if you if you get into the market in any way, uh, two years from now you're going to be an old hand, and there is a long way to go. Yeah, my, my intuition is like for the people in the Web two world that want to transition, like actually bringing Web two sensibility from a UX UI perspective to make things simple to the Web3 space is gonna be an amazing value add and, and, and strength. Like bringing the normal users onto the, onto the crypto world is gonna lead a tremendous opportunity. And it probably means a lot of more infrastructure needs to be built in terms of cross chain, et cetera. And by the way, that's also massive opportunities. Uh, it, it's really true. And I can't emphasize enough how valuable the best bringing best practices from web two is into web three. Uh, you know, there, there are so many ways that the crypto market operates that just, you know, don't make sense or, you know, are the result of how early people in crypto did things. Uh, but they often had no experience at larger web two companies or, you know, sophisticated technology companies. And so, Every day, there's ways in which I bring lessons that I've learned from from Web two or from venture into crypto and apply them, and you know, and it just makes so much sense. And then people are very willing to say, "Oh, this this makes much more sense as a best practice." Uh, structuring finance rounds is like yeah. probably case in point. The way they are structured in crypto makes very little sense. Uh, not to mention vesting and lockups and team dynamics. It is broken and it will change. And the way it changes is by people coming in from the world and bringing what, lessons. What's back. next? I mean, can you share a little bit of uh, trading volumes on Clipper and or is that confidential or like in terms of like millions per day or whatever? Uh, because it's pretty impressive that in crypto, you can go from nothing to scale very quickly. 
Yes, it's certainly not confidential. In fact, it's virtually all right on the blockchain. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to share it. Uh, so, you know, we segment this into which chain we're on. So on Polygon, for example, we launched this uh, on the 10th of this month. Um, we've done 71,000 trades. Average trade size is about 200. So, uh, you know, the, um, the total volume is about 14 million and our pool, you know, has appreciated about 6%. Um, our Clippers pool has appreciated about 6% over the past couple of weeks. And so it, that machine is really working. Um, Ethereum uh, has done about 50,000 transactions. Um, the, uh, the average trade size is about $5,000, so it's much larger. Um, and volume is around 250 million to date. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? Like zero to 264 million in a few months. It's very, it's very impressive. Things happen very quick in crypto. Um, you know, there's a bunch of reasons for that, but it, it also is hard because the market moves so fast that, you know, you have to be able to innovate very quickly in order to keep up. Um, for example, like, you know, the cost of a trade when we started was $4 in gas. The cost of trade now in gas on Ethereum mainnet is like over $50. So that really impacts volume. There's no point in doing a small trade for 500 bucks if the trade cost is 100 bucks, right? And so the market has suddenly moved. And so now, you know, we have to react and release a V2 on mainnet, you know, in, in the next month or two. And that's fine now, but you have to build your whole company to react very quickly. So you get really rapid growth you can also get really rapid changes um, and nimbleness is key. Is, um, is Shipyard going to release other DEXs than Clipper going after different types of market segments? I mean, he kind of hinted at it, but I'm not sure if that's the vision or there's something else that's next for Shipyard. Uh, it is very much the vision. So, uh, so what's coming next for Shipyard? First, we're going to release Clipper. Um, which again is targeted Wait, it's at not small released? trades. It has the best prices for small I'm using trades. It. I've used it. I could it not be Pardon? released. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, I didn't finish the sentence. There's uh, we are going to release Clipper on other chains. So right now it's on Ethereum. It's now on Polygon. Uh, we uh, are working with a bunch and speaking with a bunch of other layer ones and layer twos. We're going to release it all there. So those range from Avalanche to Optimism to Arbitrum to Polkadot to Solana okay. to Moonbeam. Um, to phantom and more uh, that enables cross-chain swaps which is something that uh, we're interested in um, but we also have a number of other dexes that we're flushing out and doing research around uh, one of these are prediction markets another is uh, one for large trades almost like a dark pool uh, another is um, you know helps you take a lot of leverage when you make when you make trades and so we're we're researching a number of ideas and and a couple of these are already under development which we'll be releasing in the, the next I, I think cross chain and automated market maker makes a lot of sense because of the latency issues you don't even know where the servers are do you think that in the in the long run um when there is super high throughput um in certain chains or because ethereum is going to is going to eat ETH2, etc order book will will take over in some of the trades or you think amm is probably the way to go especially for cross chain i think there will be both but i certainly do not think that order books regardless of how good chains get are going to dominate the market uh if you think about the uh, so just for context would, would Absolutely. If I yeah, I mean, through, like, exactly. Most people probably don't know where those making. things are, so let's take a little bit of setback. Okay. So in traditional finance, uh, the way you do markets is with an order book. Uh, this is how the New York Stock Exchange works. It's how, you know, m most exchanges work. And basically, you have a central party, the exchange, a bunch of people go in there, and they post an order to buy and an order to sell. Uh, and this creates an order book. So there's a bunch of people who say, I'll buy, you know, X asset at 200. I'll buy five units at 300. I'll buy six units at 400 uh, or vice versa. And then, you know, people put in their orders to sell. And so you have this stack of orders of different units at different prices, and then they clear at the margin. Uh, that 
happens really fast. It's really good at discovering price. There might be thousands and thousands of orders put in every second, um, and they clear at a very rapid pace. In fact, these are some of the fastest, most sophisticated technological systems in use anywhere, right? Our high-frequency trading, exchange software, it's, it's very high performance. Um, now, that doesn't work on the blockchain. And the reason it doesn't work on the blockchain is because on the blockchain, processing and storage is very expensive. So you can think of the blockchain as a distributed database, and anytime you run some code or update that code, it actually runs on thousands of computers that reach consensus on what the, res the changes and results are, which means any change is going to have thousands of redundant processing cycles. So it's super expensive. Uh, and that's what you pay for in gas on Ethereum. Because it's so expensive uh, and so slow, um, it's expensive in both processing and storage, you can't have an order book where people are putting like hundreds of orders in every second. It's just not practical. And so, so that's why automated market making became an alternative solution. And the way that works is you create a pool of inventory on the blockchain, right? So people stuff a bunch of Ethereum and, you know, uh, USD coin into a contract that sits on the blockchain. And then anyone can come and swap Ethereum for USD coin or vice versa at a price determined by a math formula, which is based on how much, uh, how much USDC and, uh, and Ethereum is in that pool. Um, and that's called an automated market maker. Doesn't require quick performance. Uh, is very low on processing and uh, and storage costs, um, but works really well, and you can always you kind of see what you're going to get. It was it has its own downside. But you don't think there's a future the where transaction throughput is so high? It, it's, I thought there was an order book already uh, dex on either Solana or Avalanche because uh, they felt they could do it, but uh, perhaps I'm mistaken. Yeah, there is on Solana, and you know it works to a certain extent, but. You know, uh, it's not just speed, mm. it's also storage cost that can get expensive. And, you know, there is no way a distributed system is going to reach the same level of performance as uh, as an offline centralized database system. Like, the yeah, actually, systems. actually, in fact, what you're saying is and the so, there are two ways of building applications. You have centralized uh, applications, which is where, where, where the Web2 world is. And you have decentralized, and both have their own advantages. And that's why not everything from the Web 2 world would go to Web 3, because some things actually benefit from distribution, security, scalability, but they're more expensive and slower. And so things that need to be super quick, mission critical, instantaneous, and inexpensive will remain centralized. And I think that's probably true of everything from marketplaces to finance and everything else. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and I think, you know, price discovery will probably always happen on centralized exchanges that are order books. Um, and automated market makers will really be glad that those exist because that's where the price gets discovered. And then the decentralized market comes into balance. Um, we have it. a question from Glowkeys. Does Shipyard Software offer any service to establish new cryptocurrencies or is it just to trade them? If not, do you have plans to do so? And by the way, are you launching your own coin? Uh, it is just, we just create exchanges. Uh, we do not create tokens. And there's a lot of regulatory uh, issues around uh, issuing tokens, including a hypothetical token of our own. And so we're a U.S. business. We can't comment on whether we'll have a token in the future. I would say that um, we do plan to decentralize governance. One way people uh, typically decentralize governance is with tokens. Uh, but I wouldn't say definitively. Are there any, speaking of regulation, I mean, you're a DEX, but at the same time, you're allowing U.S. trades, if I'm not mistaken, you, and the entire team is U.S. based. W what's your read on the regulatory framework for the world you live in? Uh, and how have you thought that through? You know, a lot of people talk about the regulations being unclear and vague. I don't really think that's true. I think they're pretty obvious. And I also think that uh, regulators are hardworking, well-meaning people. I think there's a lot of people doing things in DeFi which are just mm. not okay from a regulatory perspective. And I think the hammer is coming down. Um, 
we've been very sensitive to that. Uh, and I think any person getting a crypto should really understand the regulations. Who are the regulators? What are their missions? What do they actually care about? And why? Uh, and what applies? And like, do your own research on that because there's a lot of people will say a lot of things that just ain't true. Um, and so for us, you know, the assets in our pool, for example, are Bitcoin, Ethereum, and stable coins. These are all Bitcoin and Ethereum are commodities. They're not securities. They've been kind of stated as such. And stable coins, you know, no one's expecting profit from stable coins. And so Clipper actually stays away from all these long tail tokens, which could arguably be securities. Uh, Uniswap, for example, is supporting those. And I'm not sure how that will play out for them. Uh, but we've taken an approach of, of trying to be a very compliant exchange. We also cross check trades against a, a blacklist of uh, OFAC sanctioned addresses, which is something that hmm. really everyone in crypto should be. Um, another fun question: The audience, would you are you would, perhaps uh, Shipyard Software is not launching uh, its own coin as the whatever pay mechanism or the liquidity provision mechanism? But what about you, Mark Lurie Coin or Mark Cash? <laughs> when is that coming? Uh, you know, I there are people, there are creator coins, there are people starting to issue coins in themselves. Um, I don't foresee <laughs> myself doing that. <laughs> I'd also say that I have a friend who tried to issue equity in his future earnings <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> Smart guy ran into uh, constitutional issues because uh, both slavery and indentured servitude is illegal. And so I'm not sure you really can sell your future earnings. I know that there's a lot of like, in particular, educational financing products out in the market now uh, that kind of do that. Wait, and by friend, I you meant someone other than me? I actually tried court, to take yeah. myself public years ago. Yeah, yeah. But like, <laughs> did, 15... you? did you consult a constitutional lawyer? Well, I was thinking lawyer? of doing public in France <laughs> because I was a brand or I had more recognition in France then. I was like, hey. I'll I'll, mm. I'll I'll list myself. I'll have PwC audit all my earnings, and I'll you know if let's say list 10, 20 percent of my earnings, and you can and I distribute that every year as, as dividends to to the owners. The issue was actually not constitutional in terms of like indentured servitude. The issue is valuation expectations, where I wanted to have goodwill, right? I wanted to trade at a premium to my asset value, and all the and all the bankers that were trying to have, mm -hmm. you know take me public were like, "Well, this is your asset value. You're a conglomerate. Uh, we're, we're we're trading you at like a thirty percent discount. Your asset value." And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm going to be creating tremendous amounts of value in the future. If I'm not being valued at three x by current NAV, there is no way I'm doing this. So. <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, uh, it'll finally be a way to measure <laughs> self-confidence, the market price, <laughs> and when you're willing to to sell stock in yourself. Exactly. But that was my idea. I was like, oh, the mark at points, the market is going to undervalue me. I'll just buy back the stock, and when I feel I'm overvalued, I'll sell the stock. So I thought it would make a lot of sense. Except, you know, couldn't make it happen. But that was like 15 years ago, so not recent. So I didn't realize. Another one of your friends <laughs> that had those ideas. I think it's like <laughs> the the small cadre of like economists who think through like incentive systems and how and what makes sense who think through these ideas. I think most people would think that's completely insane. <laughs> it is a though, you know. I think uh, I'm I'm curious to see how some of the experiments in crypto around just this will will play out. Uh, so Alexander Ainsley says David Bowie did this decades ago with the Bowie bonds. So. Oh, you know, I read about that at at one point. Uh, that is interesting. I can't recall, but but I remember he. And Glowkeys is asking, uh, with such a background in the art world, do you consider yourself either an artist or collector? If so, what's your favorite thing to create or collect? Uh, I um I like clocks. I collect clocks. Um, I find them really interesting. Uh, there's a great book around the first kind of X Prize type um, prize, which the British government gave for someone who could create an accurate timekeeper at sea, which is quite a tough problem. It's really important because in order to tell longitude, you need a very accurate clock at sea. But a really tough thing. Uh, 
this guy in Britain invented it, and it's uh, one of the kind of less known reasons that the British uh, Navy was basically able to control the world. They could navigate longitude, whereas everyone else couldn't. Um, and uh, and I just I really like stuff like that. And um, uh, you know, and and so that's Fox, really cool. Do you own any NFTs? Too. Uh, <laughs> I I do own some NFTs. Uh, no crypto punks, unfortunately. I did sell the most um, expensive crypto kitty of its time for 140000 wow. back in 2018. Uh, and um, so I have a bunch of NFTs. Have but, you, uh, are you using no them punks. as your Twitter profile, et cetera, or not yet? <laughs> okay. I am not. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, um, I'm on the board of the Foundation for Art and Blockchain. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, if anyone is into NFTs or would like to donate them, please reach out to me. Uh, you can get a tax deduction and help build the endowment of a really great foundation that's helping oh, that's a lot really of NFT cool. artists. The, anything we haven't covered that we should have covered uh, or that should be mentioned? Uh, there's never an end. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I would say that, like, you know, there's... There are a lot of interesting things happening in uh, in crypto, and uh, and I, I kind of think of like DeFi as you know the traditional financial sector probably takes like ten to twenty five percent of GDP, um, and really what it does is enable the rest of the economy, um, Main Street. And so in the same way, I think of like DeFi as enabling the real economy that's emerging on the blockchain and crypto, right? Whether that's like a store of value, whether it's NFTs, whether it's gaming, whether it's just straight up gambling, uh, whether it's investing in, you know, tokens that people see as equity. Um, there's just so much happening in the real economy and like it overlaps. E each of those uh, corresponds to part of the traditional economy. And if you're trying to get into crypto, I would enter, again, I would enter where, where, it overlaps with what y you already have expertise in. Um, and, and I hope all of those grow, and I think they all will. I think DeFi uh, will help support them. And benefit Yeah, no, them. I, I have a very specific interest in DeFi as well, probably for a lot of the same reasons as you as an economist in terms of like allowing uh, the rest of the economy to function in a more, more effective way. I mean, when you think about it, the traditional financial world is completely broken. <laughs> if I sell a stock, it takes days to settle. If I wire money, it takes days to settle and like, you don't even have a real-time tracking system. In the end, they have these like big intermediaries that are cumbersome and slow and I I ineffective and like painful to deal with. So I can't wait to reinvent all of this in, in the blockchain and uh, and disrupt the, the financial intermediaries, uh, right? which I think is why Jamie Dimon <laughs> and his ilk are like, no, crypto is bad and evil. <laughs> yeah, well... Uh, I, I also doubt he's great at using social media and he probably doesn't understand uh, memes. And so, you know, if he's not a user, he's not going to get it. But once yeah. you use it, you uh, get it. Maybe last question from Luke, Luke Kitewalker. Uh, definitely a kite surfer. Why aren't NFTs used for physical assets? Aren't. Why are like they are not being aren't. used for physical assets? Uh, I think at times they are. Uh, so it is it is easy and obvious why you would use an NFT for a digital asset. Uh, but there are uh, there are many NFTs represent physical objects. Um, one way you can do this is put a physical object in a trust and make the beneficiary the you know, ownership of that that thing in a trust and then uh, make the beneficiaries of that trust, uh, the owner of an NFT, then you can transfer the NFT around and it's title uh, effectively to the physical piece. In fact, Codex, uh, a lot of the NFTs created on Codex are of physical pieces. So uh, hundreds of auction houses around the world, physical auction houses, whenever they sell an item, it is actually registered as an NFT on Codex. There's over 500,000 of these. Um, and they actually do represent physical items. Uh, they actually are moved around. They're kind of like certificates of authenticity. And so I, I think you have to be able to tie the physical piece to the NFT. 
but I, I the well, answer is uh, actually one it? last question. Do you think a crypto winter is coming? And and do you have a sense of when? Uh, I do. Uh, you know, when I did um, for Codex, we did our ICO, and crypto winter happened like immediately after. Uh, it's very important to kind of like capitalize yourself for that. I think it will happen just because, you know, that's the history of crypto. You know, obviously there's a lot of mania right now and that comes in waves. Um, so, so, you know, I, I do think it'll happen. It'll probably happen when there's a macro event that causes Bitcoin to, to crash. And then that will deflate the kind of market cap of all cryptos. And, and that will kind of be crypto winter. I think that's macro possibly outside of, uh, of, you know, endogenous crypto causes. Um, and so, yeah, I think it'll happen, but, but I also think like crypto will, will persist through and probably won't last that long. Um, and you know, the falling tide, you know, you'll see who's, there's some idiom, I forget what it is, but, uh, you'll see who, I think it's, I think it's when the tide falls, you see yes. who's wearing clothes. Yeah. yeah. Or, or like you separate the, the <laughs> men from <laughs> the boys for the men or whatever. The, the, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I could see it being resist. endogenous, by the way, to crypto, where right? like in this, in a way you could argue that all the scams around ICOs in 2017 perhaps led to the blowups. I could see how DAOs, even though they're an amazing new innovation and there are many that are extremely valuable, could lead to a, you know, another like cash grab and Ponzi scheme-esque uh, projects where um, that could lead to 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 the next crash as people start clamping down on it or like colding or or being becoming cold in the idea because so many so many people have lost everything they've had through using over leverage or just being right at scams at ponzi schemes yeah i mean i you could be right and especially as DeFi enables more and more leverage uh leverage makes the system more brittle and you can end up with a minsky moment and then there's deep leveraging and that yeah. really affects everything uh, and is also harder to come back from. So, you know, I operate as if it's, if it's an, as if it's an inevitability, uh, but certainly I- Yeah, I and our likewise, I doesn't. would rather there be no crypto winter, but, you know, have liquidity, don't put everything in crypto because <laughs> you might get it hurt and, and definitely don't use leverage, I would recommend. And if you use leverage or use very limited leverage, not, not like the 10 X or hundred X's, <laughs> I mean, like, 35%, 25%, such that if things fall 50, 60%, you're still not liquidated. Uh, probably something to live by in life as well, by the way, not just in the crypto world. Do not over lever, because when the Minsky yeah. moments or the, the leveraging events happen, they can be brutal. And uh, I know many, quote unquote, wealthy people that went bankrupt because they had too much leverage. Well, we can Amen. end that on that. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Thanks for having so me. So everyone in the audience, uh, next week, I'll be doing a Ask Me Anything session. So I want to have a guest or a topic. So prepare the questions, send them away, and uh, we'll take it from, from there. So I look forward to having all of you next week. Thank you, Mark, again.